The movie begins with a woman named Cassie, panting and running through the woods. She seems terrified, running from something. There's a sound of screeching and insects hissing as she suddenly stops. Then, someone grabs her from behind. She screams as the person holds her tight. He introduces himself as Jared, telling her to keep calm and stay quiet. He points at a strange creature approaching them, but reassures her that everything will be fine. The man asks her what she was doing there, and she says that she was walking with her friends when they all disappeared. The man frowns and tells her that they are all gone for good. Jared tries to convince her to seek refuge in a tunnel, but she's uncertain about it. Just then, there's a sound of something approaching and Jared disappears into the tunnel. A terrified Cassie goes in search of him inside the tunnel, calling for him. She runs, trying to meet up with Jared, who's nowhere to be found. There are sounds of screeching and footsteps approaching. On the other hand, we see Jared get into a room filled with multiple bunk beds. He rushes to hide under one of the beds. The lights in the room are flickering, when suddenly he sees an army of tiny mice under the bed. He screams as they rush up to his face. Meanwhile, the woman is still looking for Jared. She gets into a room where she sees someone lying on a bed. She approaches this motionless person and recognizes the person to be Terry. Terry is covered in blood and the woman is in tears as she notices Terry's scarred face. She's still calling out for Terry and shaking her to wake up when blood spurts out of Terry's mouth onto her face. Just then there's a sound of screeching. She is petrified. She hopes it to be Jared, but it's not. The sound of footsteps gets louder and closer as Cassie begins to pant in horror. As she turns around, she is petrified to find three gory-looking creatures in the room with her. They grip her and pin her to the floor as they tear her apart. The poor woman yells and screams as blood splashes all over her face. Poor Cassie groans in utter agony as her belly is gruesomely punctured. The scene transitions, and we see a girl named Abigail, whose family and friends are concerned about her They're concerned about her mental health and how she's no longer the same. She's failing in college, so they seek help from a counselor Kara. The counselor suggests that Abigail should go somewhere remote, where she can disconnect from familiarity, and that it would be good for peace and tranquility. She claims it will help her abstain and improve her health. So Abigail's parents agree to the idea. Abigail and her family, alongside Laura, her best friend, get ready to pack for the trip to a rehabilitation center. On the other side, we see the three monsters munching on flesh and blood, while playing a poem called The Three Blind Mice. Back to Abigail's house, the group is ready to load their stuff in the car. Abigail is leaning on the vehicle when Laura approaches her. Laura just claims to be concerned for Abigail just like her parents, and that is why she came. Abigail on the other hand, is upset that Laura poses to be a saint like she's never done before. Laura doesn't deny using once or twice, but says Abigail's usage is more alarming. Everyone's now set for the trip. Kara suggests that she and Abigail travel together, so they can chat on the way, while her family and friend can travel together. Abigail sees this opportunity quite agreeable, since she would be able to ditch those people that she almost considers annoying. They all arrive, and the first thing Abigail does is take pictures. Kara doesn't accommodate the idea, so she quickly takes Abigail's phone and everyone else's advice that they need to focus on Abigail and her recovery. She brings out a plastic box and puts all their phones in there. After that, they all get inside this place which is in the middle of the woods. After entering the musty house, they all comment on the place. Later, Kara is alone with Abigail's mum. The poor old woman confides in Kara that she fears she might be at fault for Abigail's addiction. But the latter reaffirms that she'd figure out the real reason why Abigail finds solace and tricks and make sure Abigail gets better. However, she does warn Abigail's mum that the process and journey to Abigail getting sober again won't be pretty, but it will happen. She will get sober. Then Kara hugs her and leaves to go get food for everyone to eat. It's now nightfall, and we see Kara in her car on her way to get groceries. Suddenly her car gets stuck in some barbed wires, and she has to come down to fix it. As she's trying to get rid of the wires, she injures one of her fingers, which starts to bleed. On the other hand, Abigail wakes up to find Laura. The woman comes to her and tries to offer her emotional support, but Abigail still wants none of it. She accuses Laura of being a narcissist, saying that all she cares about is herself and no one else. Aggravated by this, Laura leaves her alone. She goes to sit with Abigail's family and complains about the girl's attitude towards her. They tell her not to take it personally. Abigail usually gets like that when she's under the influence. Moody, angry and speaking without thought. Just then, Abigail's father, who's starving, waiting for Kara who went to buy food for them, decides to go for a walk and clear his head. He grabs his jacket and exits. Our attention now turns back to Kara. 
who's still stuck in the woods injured, and is now trying to clean up her wound. While she is busy tending to her injured finger, she's approached by two creatures squealing at her. As she looks up, the poor woman is terrified at the sight of them and slowly moves back. Then she turns around and sees something. Her eyes go wide and she screams. Meanwhile, Abigail plans to escape. Her mum comes to check in on her, but she pretends to be asleep. When her mother leaves, she sneaks out of the room. On the other hand, Abigail's dad, who had earlier claimed to be going for a walk, is now smoking outside. He says he quit smoking for 10 days, but goes outside to smoke and relishes the moment. Guess that is where Abigail's addictive personality came from. He is still smoking when someone in a purple hoodie rushes past him. He guesses it to be Abigail and immediately throws away the cigarette and goes after the figure. The person in a hoodie is speedily rushing through the forests and he's struggling to keep up with the person's pace. Then we see Abigail, who's dressed in a purple hoodie. She's alone in the middle of the forest and carefully looks around as there are weird sounds all over the place. As she is moving there, she bumps into her dad. He inquires where she's going so late at night. He can sense that she's angered and hurt and sees the rehabilitation process as a punishment. But he promises her that it's all for the better. She denies being addicted. Her dad tries to get her back into the cabin. It's late and they're outside in the wet cold environment, but Abigail protests. Just as they're talking, he gets hit with an arrow and falls on his face to the ground. Abigail is scared, but she's rather curious as to how someone randomly gets shot by an arrow in the middle of the night in the forest. They need to get out of there, but Abigail's dad can't move. He's groaning in pain. Then, another arrow flies across them and lands on a tree. Abigail is now even more terrified and tries to get her father up from the ground so they can leave. He manages to get up, but then they come to the realization that neither of them knows their way back to the cabin. Back at the cabin, Laura and Mark are in search of Abigail. They're standing outside calling out her name, but getting no response. Meanwhile, Abigail and her father are still stuck in the woods. Her father is badly injured and barely able to walk. They're struggling to find their way when they see a parked vehicle. They both struggle to get to it, and when they do, they find it to be Kara's vehicle. The car is there, but they can't find Kara nor the keys to start the car. Abigail is inside the vehicle and her dad's outside, waiting for her to find the car keys. Suddenly the menacing creature approaches him and squeezes the arrow on his back. He immediately groans in agony. Abigail, who is inside the car, quickly looks up to see what's wrong with her father when something touches her. As she turns around, she comes face to face with a monster. Both Abigail and her father scream in terror and disbelief. They are alone in the woods with strange giant monsters that sound like mice. Meanwhile, at the cabin, Abigail's mother has now sent out Laura and Mark to go searching for them. She hands them a couple of torches and sends them into the woods to find Abigail and Keith. What a smart move. It is totally logical to send out additional two people with torches out into the woods when two are already lost. The scene shifts, and we now see Abigail strapped to a chair in a place that seems like a hospital. She looks around and finds someone lying on a bed with some sort of metal punctured in their eyes. She recognizes this person to be Kara. Abigail is petrified. She's crying and screaming for help when she sees the monster in the room with them. Abigail then sees her father who's tied to a bed. She expresses her sorrow to him about how she thinks they're all going to get slaughtered. Kara is whimpering as the monster draws closer to her. Her lips have been sewn shut, and she's covered in blood. Abigail is in despair as one of the monsters approaches her. Her father tries to draw the attention of the monster away from her to himself. Abigail is disheartened by this. She doesn't want her father getting hurt. But he too doesn't want his daughter to go through any agony either. He wants her to run to safety. He expresses his love for his daughter whilst being attacked by the monster and tells her to run away. The monster uses its claws to puncture his eyes. Kara, on the other hand, who is barely alive gets acid poured into her eyes by the other monster. She yells in agony as she perishes. Abigail's father is yelling his daughter's name in despair. As his eyes are being punctured by the monster, blood gushes out and Abigail cries for him. Meanwhile, the search continues for Abigail on the other end. Laura and Mark are in the thick of the dark forest with torches, yelling Abigail's name hoping to find her. Back in the hospital where Abigail and her father are still being tortured by the monsters, Abigail's father is now lying on the floor, his eyes punctured and in utter agony. He apologizes to Abigail as he writhes in pain, blood dripping down his face. Right behind him is one of the monsters who's holding up a huge hammer, ready to attack. Abigail yells for it to get away from her father but to no avail. The monster raises the hammer high up in the air and lands it right on Keith's head, instantly taking him out. 
The pain Abigail feels just cannot be described in words. She struggles to get herself free. The demons sense this and immediately get on their feet. Abigail runs out of the room as fast as she can. But these three giant mice are on her tail. The girl quickly goes to hide in a power control room. She sees the monster approach, but is careful to not be found. She's anxious yet clumsy as she keeps bumping into everything. Hearing the noise, one of the creatures finds her hiding spot and comes face to face with her. However, it turns out, they are blind. She makes sure not to make noise, and thus it is unable to catch her. Abigail then manages to escape from it and runs down the stairs. They seem to be everywhere she is, and hiding from them proves difficult. She then runs into another room, where she finds boards with pinned pictures and one paper titled Missing Children. There she quickly finds a map of the place. One of the mice stealthily approaches her, sniffing and trying to pick up her scent. She sees it and tries to avoid being caught by it. Then, there's the sound of the door. This distracts the mouse, and so she rushes out of the door with a piece of paper in her hands. Amid all the chaos, we shift our focus back to the forest, where Laura and Mark are still in search of Abigail. They're now talking and trying to come up with answers as to where Abigail disappeared and how she disappeared. Meanwhile, Abigail finds her way out of the tunnel and runs straight into the woods. Laura and Mark finally find her as she runs up to them and falls into Mark's arms. They inquire what happened, but Abigail just seems too terrified to speak. Poor woman can't get her words right. They get back to the cabin where Abigail's mother has been sitting anxiously since. She tries to engage with her daughter, but Abigail is too traumatized to respond. Laura and Mark debate about Abigail being intoxicated. Mark thinks Abigail is high, thus she is behaving likewise. After arguing back and forth, they decide that they would drive the girl to a hospital in town while the oblivious mother would wait for Keith to come back. Laura comes to calm Abigail, yet the poor traumatized woman can only mumble how the monsters are coming for them. Abigail's mum goes to get some towels and finds the window open. While closing it, she begins to hear the sound of mice screeching under her bed and bends down to see. She's still looking under when the door creaks open and there's the sound of footsteps approaching. The woman slightly turns to have a look. When a foot lands on her back, heavily making her bleed, and she screams in pain. Meanwhile Mark, who had heard the sound of knocking and went to open the door, is attacked by a giant mouse. He tries to run up the stairs, but the mouse uses its claws to injure him badly and makes him stop. He screams as he rushes into the kitchen to arm himself. There, he picks up a knife and uses it on the monster that's approaching him. As he attacks it with a weapon, the giant mouse seems to lose its footing. When Mark approaches it again, it throws him to the floor. The boy manages to pick the knife back up, and when the mouse climbs on him to attack, he uses the knife to injure it multiple times. The crimson blood splashes all over Mark's face, and the terrifying monster finally squeaks and falls to the ground. The girls are hiding in the room and are trying to hold the door closed when Mark arrives banging on the door for them to let him in. They open the door and are terrified to see him covered in blood. However, he lets them know that it's not his blood he's covered in. Just then, Mark and Abigail see their mother being held hostage by another giant mouse, telling them to run. She's covered in blood and the giant mouse behind her throws her to the ground. The monster then begins squeaking as if summoning something. All of a sudden, an army of tiny mice rush up to Abigail's mother, who's still lying on the floor and cover her up. Abigail, Laura and Mark are petrified by this. Poor Abigail is out of control. She has now witnessed the slaughter of both her parents and is on the verge of going crazy. Mark tries to control her as he pushes her back into the room and Laura immediately tries to lock the door. Mark consoles Abigail and tells her to be strong. Seeing Laura struggle, Mark then rushes to assist her. He then volunteers to hold up the door while the girls run. Abigail is scared for him as both she and Laura make their way out through the window. After they fail to start up their car, they decide to go back to the bunker to get Kara's keys from her so they can use her vehicle. In the meantime, one of the mice finds the deceased body of the other giant mouse. Mark finally lets go of the door and tries to rush out through the window, but the mouse catches up with him and bites his leg. He manages to push the monster and jump down the window where the girls find him. They're now heading to find the bunker, but Mark can't continue and thus tells Laura to go with Abigail. He says that he'll wait for them in Kara's car. Laura protests, but Mark manages to convince her. Meanwhile, there are now two blind mice on the loose. Mark makes it to a tree near Kara's car. He is bleeding and in pain as he leans into it. Just then, Laura approaches. She says that she can't leave him alone in that condition. Laura goes to the trunk of the car to look for a first aid kit and finds it. As she turns back to him, she sees one of the giant mice with a wire across Mark's neck, ready to strangle him while he has his eyes closed. She tries to warn him 
but fails as the mouse immediately uses the wire to strangle Mark, who bleeds to his demise. Then the mouse pushes Mark over as he falls to the ground and tramples on his head, making it burst open. A petrified Laura screams in terror at the sight and runs away. Meanwhile, down in the bunker, Abigail uses the map she stole earlier to find her way around. On the other hand, the two blind mice catch up with Laura and hit her across the face as she falls to the ground. They each grab her leg and drag her as she screams. Abigail gets inside the bunker as the lights are flickering. She finds Kara's lifeless body still laid on the table and approaches her to search for her keys. Turns out, the keys are not there. Abigail then goes into another room which is filled with bunk beds. She then proceeds to some lockers where she begins searching. She's still searching when a video begins playing on the wall. Abigail watches the video as it plays out. On the other hand, Laura is tied to a bed with one of the mice beside her. She's screaming for help and unable to move, while the mouse picks up a needle and begins sewing her lips. Just then, Abigail sneaks up on the monster, holding a hammer. She approaches it and dashes it across its head multiple times, and it falls to the ground. Abigail then rushes to Laura who's still lying there whimpering in agony. She picks up a pair of scissors and uses it to cut through Laura's sewn lips. Abigail not so gently cuts through the thread on her lips. Once she's done cutting, she hugs Laura, who's traumatized by what she has experienced. The girl then goes back to where Keith is lying. She kneels down before him and takes off her sweater, which she uses to cover his body. Taking the matchbox from his pocket, Abigail goes back to where the mouse is lying, still badly hurt as she had hit it multiple times on its head. She picks up a pair of scissors and begins to unleash her fury on it. Attacking the repulsive creature multiple times, she tries to lessen her overwhelming grief and sorrow. She's lost her father, mother and brother. Abigail doesn't seem to stop attacking until Laura approaches her and tries to make her stop. There's now only one blind mouse left while Abigail and Laura are also left alone in a fight for survival. They are both in hiding and the mouse is trying to pick up their scent. Laura's in a bathroom trying to hide from the mouse who's lurking around. Despite her trying to be discreet, the mouse catches her and grabs her by her neck. He raises her in the air, choking her. Laura struggles, but the mouse overpowers her. Unable to fight back anymore, Laura also accepts her fate at the hands of this ugly and repulsive predator. Just then, Abigail arrives and screams at the monster to get its attention. He drops Laura to the floor, her eyes wide open, and follows the new distraction. She runs up the stairs and sees the mouse right behind her. Abigail then finds refuge behind a glass, but when the mouse approaches her, it picks up her scent and tries to trace it. Abigail sees it through the glass and tries to talk to the mouse. She knows it cannot see her, but it can hear. Abigail tries to connect with the monster, saying that she understands. She says that she watched the videos and saw the torture it went through, and how it's been reduced to nothing but animals. Despite what it went through, it didn't have a right to put her family through that kind of torture, torment, and trauma. She cries as she expresses her grief for the loss of her father, mother, brother, and now her best friend. She says she's lost everything, and pleads for the mouse to let her go. Abigail continues to plead with tears rolling down her cheek, but the mouse appears indifferent and unable to process what she's saying. Just then, there's a loud thud and the giant mouse falls to the ground. It's Laura, who has used a hammer on the mouse. Abigail then rushes to Laura and pulls her to herself as she hugs her. They run out, leaving the giant mouse on the floor. After a while, they arrive at a room and stop, as Abigail grabs fuel and says she's going to burn the place down. Approving the idea, Laura also helps her pour the fuel in every nook and cranny. They grab more and more fuel and continue to pour it all over the place. After finishing, the two hug each other, relieved. However, just then, there's a sound of animal screeching. They both look up trying to trace the sound. Before they can react, Laura is fatally injured with a steel pipe. Blood gushes out of her wound and splashes all over Abigail's face. Abigail screams in agony. She has now lost her best friend too. The poor girl is in pain as she watches the mouse pull out the iron pipe from her best friend's body. The mouse sniffs and tries to approach Abigail. Angered, the girl takes out the matchbox which she had earlier taken out of her father's pocket. She yells and cries out in anguish as she takes out a matchstick, strikes it, and throws it onto the ground. It flames up and burns both the mouse and Laura who has already passed away. The traumatized girl cries as she watches them burn. Moments later, before she too becomes a victim of the fire. Abigail runs away. She runs as fast as she can. It is now morning outside. She finds a safe distance and watches the bunker explode. The scene shifts, and we now see a devastated Abigail, covered in blood, slowly walking through the forests. The birds chirp as she turns around to have a look, 
before continuing to move on. Meanwhile, on the other side, behind a tree we see the terrifying hand of a mouse appear before it comes out of hiding and the movie ends there. Who knows what the last blind mouse would do?